want to talk about how to listen with your soul. And the reason I want to bring this up is because I've observed, uh, well, for many years, but also uh, being here in India, that uh, as I meet people, travel around, and experience the culture here, uh, you're probably aware that while there are some areas in America that are quite crowded, uh, India's got us beat <laughs> in terms of crowds of people. And uh, I think that that's a factor in this. I don't think it's the only factor. But uh, what I've observed is that uh, in order to deal with that, I know in uh, uh, Japanese culture, they uh, the walls between the rooms in, in uh, some of the homes are just paper. And so people actually learn to turn in uh, and ignore other things out of courtesy. So they train themselves not to see and not to hear things that are none of their business. And in this way they create a certain kind of privacy. It's a protection against all of the, um, the closeness, people being so close. And I think there's a factor in that here in India is that um, people, uh, uh, because you can't control it, because it's so overwhelming, there's a tendency to shut it out. And that in itself is not a bad thing, but when we, when we shut things out, sometimes we shut out more than we intend. And so I've observed, and, and again, this is, uh, I've seen this in America too, but um, well, you know, I'm always making fun of drivers in India, and I know that you all do it too, so it's okay. Um, but Indian drivers don't pay, any, pay very much attention to the other people on the road. In other words, they just pull out and they assume that everyone is going to get out of the way. They don't even look. So in that sense, they're not listening. You see what I'm saying? They're not listening to the circumstance. They're just in their own space. And I've seen many times, especially, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, shopping areas can become quite crowded. And uh, so, and the, the aisles are quite narrow. And, and, well, the streets are narrow too in many places. But what I've observed is that people will stop in the aisle and block it up and not be aware or even concerned that they're blocking other people. And of course, you see this on the streets too. The cars will stop in the middle of the road for no reason. <laughs> and, it, and it always amazes me. Indians are used to going around. So it doesn't matter how jammed things get, Indians will figure out how to keep it moving. And I do admire that. In America, we go, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, but it, it, this is an example of not seeing outside of your own personal space. And listening is connected to this sense of space. Um, uh, well, this happens when you're, uh, uh, people are talking too. If you think about when you're listening to, you're having a conversation, are you actually listening to the other person? Or are you thinking ahead? You know, in other words, they're talking and you're thinking about what you're gonna say next. Are you really actually listening? Or maybe you're hearing what they're saying, but are you giving it how much attention? Most of the time we give it very little attention. And this is one of the reasons why people don't uh, find communication very successful much of the time, is because they're both so busy in their own internal space that they can't reach out to find harmony with that other person in, in terms of whatever, whatever they're trying to get to. And uh, I've uh, uh, shared this before, but I observe in, in negotiations. So uh, uh, in India, um, the level, the volume level and the intensity level increases. Uh, 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 okay. You know, then the, the negotiation is complete and then everybody's friendly again. And people don't even recognize that that's what's happening because it's such a normal part of life 
No, no, this is just the way it is. And if you could be, uh, see it from another space, you would have a different point of view uh, if you can see that other point of view. And this is one of the things that we, uh, these pictures that I'm trying to paint are connected to the power of listening, which is connected to, in its, or, you know, in its original form, is the power of perception, soul perception. Consciousness is infinite consciousness, but it's been uh, uh, um, brought down to the level of ego consciousness and the thoughts, uh, conscious and subconscious thoughts that we have um, uh, every day. Uh, and the reactions that we have every day. You know, when we're listening to people, our reaction to that is colored by our past. And it could be our past in terms of this life, but it could be our past in terms of other lives. We have negative reactions to other people's points of view that aren't just connected to the information that, um, that they're actually saying. We get underneath it that's a tone of voice, but ultimately, I think most people today recognize that we respond to vibrations in people. Their, their essential uh, energy, quality of consciousness that's coming through as energy. So we need to understand that all of life is an expression underneath of energy. And underneath that energy is consciousness. So we need, if we want to listen, we need to connect to to perceive the energy underneath what we're trying to listen to. And we need to then understand that that energy expresses qualities of consciousness, not just information. So let's say you're listening to music. You're not listening just to um, frequencies of notes. You're not listening just to words. But you're listening to an expression of consciousness. So if we uh, begin to see life through that filter of consciousness, and this is what I mean when I say soul, uh, listen with our souls, how to listen to life with our souls, it's a combination of um, uh, mental, physical, and spiritual energy. It's all of those at the same time. It's not that we shouldn't listen to music to hear it, but we also, along with the musical content, need to listen to the consciousness underneath it. And that is expressed both in terms of the composition, but also in terms of the musicians. The people who are uh, uh, expressing the vibrations, the consciousness of the composer. And so all of these um, components are part of listening. So, in terms of our own personal life experience, uh, most of us grow up listening through our ears only. We hear things. And as we, uh, uh, when we're very young, we have um, uh, very quick and um, uh, automatic emotional responses to the things that we hear. Could, could you, it's kind of disturbing me actually. <laughs> Just have them go upstairs. <laughs> see, I'm hearing, you see, I'm hearing not just me, I'm hearing the whole space. And this is what I want to communicate, is that you want to reach out, not just with your ears, but with your consciousness. Uh, I've shared this before, but, um, uh, you see, he doesn't realize that he's disturbing me. You see, because he's not listening from that side. And not just with his ears, but with perception. I've uh, shared in the past the story um, back in the 70s, actually it was 1976. I went to a, um, a, a conference with Swami Kriyananda, and he uh, was uh, one of the keynote speakers in the, in the uh, conference. But, um, and, and so, and the hall was quite large. I think there was uh, at least 2,500, 3,000 people there. It was a good-sized group. And uh, Kriyananda came up to speak. And he uh, walked across the stage. And I was in the, in the very back of the hall. So I could see 
the audience, and I could sort of perceive the totality of what was taking place. And so he walked across the stage and stepped up to the podium. And to that point, it was just a man walking across the stage. But there was a point at which he stepped into the podium, and I, I, I can only tell you that I, I perceive this happening, is that he somehow went from being a man at the podium to being fully present in the whole room. The whole room. And he's talked about this in the past where he talked about consciously doing that. And what he said that he was doing when he did that is that he said he was listening. He was including. When he speaks, he doesn't lecture. He shares. And, the, and sharing implies a two-way communication. Sharing is not just talking at people. But it's, it's a kind of um, back and forth flow. Even if the other person isn't speaking, there's two-way communication. You're tuning into. You're being with that other person. This inner reaching out with your soul, this is soul listening. <clears throat> and when we do this, we receive intuitive perceptions and understandings that are past just the cogs turning into mind. <laughs> and it's deeper than emotional response. Emotional response, when you're listening to music, you say, you say well, I was moved to tears. Okay, this, this could happen easily. But when we are moved to tears, when we react to life strictly emotionally, emotions are ego-bound. When we listen with our emotions, we're listening only to our personal feelings. And our energy flow from previous uh, connections of past karma, whether they, again, whether they be this life or last life, some other, some emotional response. This is only me oriented. We have to learn to listen outside of that. I'm not saying we should never have an emotional response. You can't control it much of the time. But we want to learn to expand our perception so that our personal emotional response is such a much smaller part of what we're hearing, of what we're perceiving. And eventually, it will very much be in the background. Master, when um, mm -hmm. Sister John Amata passed, he cried. When he was uh, a child and his mother died, he was very upset. Now, as an avatar, he didn't need to have those responses. But the key is, is those responses didn't control him. He controlled them. As a young boy, we don't fully understand what that looked like from inside his head. <laughs> he was playing the role of a young boy, you know, as an avatar, it's a completely different circumstance. But we know as an adult, when Sister Gyanamata passed, you know, he said he saw her uh, 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 expand out into the watchful state, into the state of complete union with God. That you wouldn't be sad about that. <laughs> But he was also, as a human being, he was seeing that his friend, his supporter, was going to be away. And so he was, he could see both at the same time. And he would allow himself to be quote unquote human and normal while he was simultaneously one with infinite spirit. Our, our goal is to, to be like that, to be normal. Korean energy was so kind of normal in his own way, in the way of being him. And yet he was simultaneously, uh, you could perceive through his life that he was connected to this much larger reality. And if we were open to it and sensitive to it, we could feel it and write it. We could, and this is why, this is Darshan. This is why we want the vibrations of the saints, because we can write their vibrations but we have to listen with our souls to perceive them. And when we meditate and everything that we do in the spiritual life is geared for creating a better ability to have this deeper perception, to have this ability to perceive 
more of what life truly is, which is of which the physical plane is only a very small part. But we've been trained only to listen to the senses. And we need to have soul perception. We call it super conscious, super consciousness. And that is that which is most closely connected to God consciousness, infinite universal consciousness. So, one of the ways that we, um, uh, uh, when we uh, talk about uh, newcomers come for the class of meditation, and uh, uh, I often do this little breathing exercise uh, where I have them take two breaths and have them check and see uh, if any mental change takes place if you just take two breaths. And almost most people feel a change. You feel calmer, more quiet, more connected inside. And I said, well, what happened? You've been breathing, how many breaths have you taken since you came into the class? Who knows, hundreds, thousands. But you take two conscious breaths, and it's a completely different experience. And yes, there is a certain physiological aspect to it, but the larger part of it is that when we do things consciously, it makes a, a, a complete difference as to what we perceive and what gets accomplished. So if we want to listen with our souls, we have to listen consciously. We have to pay attention to what's going on. We have to get past this cultural uh, 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 tendency to close things off, to disconnect. If and when we listen to life, we have to realize that we're not just listening with the ears, but with the power of perception, which is connected to spirit. So the more we listen with our spirit, with our inner intuitive perception, the more of life we're going to hear. More things we'll see that are underneath the surface of what's going on. So uh, when you're talking to people, listen. Listen to the totality. Reach out past just the words. If you want to know if people are telling you the truth, feel them. This is actually a part of uh, American slang in, uh, uh, is uh, and the, uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the people will go, you feel me? You feel what I'm saying? Usually it's, it's because they're, they're mad at the other guy. You feel me? I mean, I'm going to get you if you don't do what I say. You feel me? But underneath it, it's, it's true. You feel what's taking place. So, this feeling, again, is not emotional response. Initially, you will feel your emotional response, but you have to take it to calmness. You have to take it to that inner stillness. It's in this inner stillness that we can then perceive larger realities. And this, so, so, listening inwardly in stillness is an essential component to listening, to perception. And this is why meditation is so important, and this is why Kriya is so powerful. The Kriya, a yoga technique, is so powerful because it takes us to a deeper, well, one of the reasons, because it takes us to a deeper level of calmness. Uh, I had the opportunity to be in seclusion with uh, Swami Kriyananda, and uh, for an extended period of time, and at that time, this was again back in the 70s, and uh, to that point, um, this seclusion period took me to a deeper level of stillness than I had ever experienced before. And I began to, well, uh, you, most of you know that Kriyanandaji was a prolific composer. And uh, one of the reasons I talk about this today is because we're having a concert um, uh, with the Joy Singers. But um, it's a subject that I've wanted to talk about uh, because I've observed this, this closing in and limiting of uh, how we affect others as well. It's not just what we see, but how, how, or what is, how is what I'm doing affecting other people? And we have to listen in order to realize that. 
And um, so uh, music is very much a part of the Ananda culture. And uh, mostly we only play Kriyananda's music, occasionally some other things. But mainly Kriyananda's music. Fortunately, uh, with four with uh, four hundred pieces of, of music, there's a variety. <laughs> but there's a certain commonality in all of his music, and that is that it makes you feel peaceful inside. It calms you down. I I read recently an article. Uh, they were talking about uh, people who have trouble sleeping, and they're saying, well, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can't go back to sleep. Listen to some soothing music, and that will help to calm you down a little bit. It might, it might help you. But the thing they didn't get in this article is something that I got in this seclusion, which is uh, I, I thought of Swami's music as being calming, because relative to everyday life, it was calming. But I had gotten in this seclusion into a state of peacefulness, that, calmness, that I had never been to before. But one day, uh, Kriyananda went out on a, a, a walk, and so I, no one's in the home, I'm, I'm here by myself. I'm feeling like a little, uh, I don't know, like I need to do something, not just sit quietly. And uh, so I thought, I'm gonna take the guitar out, I'm gonna play one of Swami's songs. Uh, that's uh, a good thing to do. So I start playing one of the songs, and I realized that in the state of calmness that I had gotten into because of the seclusion, even his, his calming music was agitating <laughs> to me in that moment. So then we understand that um, agitation is relative to your state of calmness. So the calmer you are, the more aware you are of calmness. Now, uh, I had never seen it from that point of view before, because to me, his music was the ultimately calming thing. But the reality is that all music is rajasic, it's activating, it's stimulating. But we know that uh, 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 in our study of the gunas, we know that there's uh, tamas, downward pulling, uh, tattvic, which is uh, elevating, and then there's rajas in the middle, activating. And activating can go downward okay. or upward. And this is what we want to do when we're stimulated with uh, input from the world, is we want to take that stimulation, which is by its definition stimulating, therefore it's rajasic to some degree, but we want to take it up so that it goes towards sattva. And then of course, the more elevating it starts, the easier it is to do. It's easy to elevate Swami's music. It's harder to elevate uh, heavy metal <laughs> music, <laughs> you know. Um, and remember that the perception of the music is not just an issue of the composer's notes and their consciousness, um, uh, but also of the vibrations of the performers. Uh, in America, uh, um, musically, uh, uh, Christian rock and roll is actually very popular. Many of the modern Christian churches basically have concert. Their Sunday service is basically a rock concert, but the words are quotes from the Bible. And they don't get <laughs> that Christ consciousness is not being served just by quotes. And it's being um, uh, actually uh, the devil, <laughs> the confusion has gotten the, uh, into the church by thinking that you can come closer to God through pounding drums and uh, a strong bass beat and a fancy electric guitar. Now, any of those instruments could be used in an elevating way. But stylistically, if you take generally rock and roll, it's not stylistically designed for upliftment. It's designed for emotional response. So what do, do people do when they go to rock concerts? They yell their heads off. 
How can you be listening to music if you're yelling your head off? <laughs> you're not. You're going into this state of, of emotional response and you're increasing it through uh, letting that energy come out through your voice and through your body. You, you don't see people, most people, listening to music at rock concerts like this. <laughs> no. They're doing this. They're all, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to, that's as far as I'm going to take that one. <laughs> so, but they're all activated. We need to learn to listen in stillness. Go to the heart of the music, whatever you're listening to, uh, the heart of the conversation, the heart of the circumstances in life that you find yourself, and listen to with your spirit, the vibrational essence of what's taking place. I remember when I came to Ananda and Swamiji used to, we didn't have a choir. Uh, it was just Swami, which I, I liked. <laughs> and he would sing, uh, he did a, 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 an album called Songs of the Soul. And, and, uh, uh, but he would sing, uh, for example, one of his songs, uh, Through Many Lives and uh, talking about the soul's journey and, and how uh, long it takes and how, uh, you know, uh, but no matter what happens, I'm just going to keep my uh, dedication to seeking God. And he would sing, of course, he had a beautiful voice, but what made his voice more beautiful was the vibrations. And so you got this incredible blending of um, initially it was emotional response, but if you learn to listen in the calmness, it, it was this pure uplifting aspiration for spirit. And you could write it. You could you just go into his voice, and this is one of the reasons why Master said that chanting is half the battle. Because it's much more e uh, easy to sing than it is to meditate. Right away, you're, you're you know, because you've got something to do. I mean, something more physical than uh, a meditation technique. And then what you're doing is you're riding a wave of consciousness in the direction, in an upward, elevating, sattvic direction. This is what we want to do all the time, is ride life in an in, and to recognize that life is always in motion. Life is ever new consciousness flowing. So what we want to do, and everybody talks about, uh, people like to talk about kundalini. I want my kundalini to rise. And what we want to do is to begin to recognize upward flowing energy in the spine. And we want to ride that with our consciousness. And it goes up and it expands out. And in this way, we begin to write inner currents of consciousness that we had never perceived before. We didn't know it was there. But we begin not to just theorize about it, but to actually experience it. This is the essential truth of the spiritual life, is that it's an experience, it's not just a story that you hope it is true. It's an actual experience. So when you listen to music, begin... Uh, uh, when I started thinking about the subject, uh, the, the, the subject of wine came up in my mind. Now, I haven't had a drink of wine since I was, I don't even know. I took a, one sip of champagne when I was in my early 20s. Uh, I went to a wedding. They had the toast. And I, I was already and I, I struggled in my mind. But I was feeling a little rebellious, I suppose. Uh, I've never liked alcohol, so I took, I took a sip of it. Previous to that, very little alcohol in my life. I had other problems, but that wasn't one of them. In any case, um, I happen to know more about wine than I should know, <laughs> in as much as I don't uh, partake of it. You see, when you, when you drink wine, you're supposed to... Uh, Sniff the bouquet. You know, how's it smell? And look at the color. 
you know, look at the color. So he, he, I have an expert over here. <laughs> He's going, oh, yes, no. yes. <laughs> He's going, yes, I am. No, 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 no. Okay. So um, then you take the sip. You don't, you know, you don't chug it. You don't just gulp it down. You let it trickle down the palate <laughs> and let it let it swoosh around in there. <laughs> and then you get the aftertaste. Then, then you get that, how does it feel afterwards? This is how <laughs> we should drink life. <laughs> Check it out. Check the bouquet is the vibrations. What does it look like on the outside? But then go, go more and more deep into it. And then, how do you feel afterwards? This is one of the ways that we should evaluate all life experiences. Is, 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 is as to whether we want to do them again or not, is how does it make me feel after I've participated? Do I feel depleted? Do I feel agitated? Does this make me angry, upset, uh, or disconnected to something more positive in my life? This is the, <coughs> the, um, the way to evaluate rather than uh, is this on the list of somebody says this is okay and then they say no, it's not okay. That's not the way we do it. And to recognize that no matter what we do in life, whatever life experience God gives us, we can redirect the energy of that experience in and up. And this is how people have gotten through incredible uh, negative, what we would describe as, uh, I'll say, unpleasant life experiences. Whether they be uh, injuries or imprisonment or torture, whatever, somehow they're able to internalize the experience and offer it up. Connect it to not just uh, a um, intellectual offering, but an actual flow of energy, an actual inner offering. And this is something that we need to do when we pray. It's not just intellect. It's a flow of consciousness. It's a flow of consciousness to infinite uh, uh, consciousness. And this is, this is uh, what we need to recognize is that we are infinite consciousness stepped down to in, in, you know, soul consciousness which is individualized the spirit. So our, the components of our, uh, the very thing that we describe ourselves as, as a soul, is infinite spirit. But with limitations, it's become individualized. And instead of being directed towards listening to infinite spirit, we become directed towards living in the body, which is ego consciousness. So we've shut ourselves off from that larger potential. So as, and in fact, all of meditation is, is about learning how to listen with your spirit, really. You're, you're, you're trying to attune yourself to something that already is. You're not creating it. You're just getting into the flow of it and gradually perceiving more and more of it. So I encourage you to do some experiments in listening. Deepen your ability to listen in meditation, to perceive. When we call to God, then listen. Listen for God's voice. And not, it's not just the voice of, yes, I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the feeling of the presence. This is why Om in, in Christian tradition is called the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. You feel this comforting presence, but it's only experienced in <coughs> deeper and deeper calmness. So we don't seek uh, catharsis in our relationship with God, an emotional building up until eventually you burst and you cry or you faint. Uh, uh, some of the groups in America, the ev evangelical groups, uh, they get all excited. And again, with the rock and roll and whatever, however they produce this excitement, yes, it's good to, to raise the energy, but then you have to take the energy directed inward and upward. So when you listen to music, when you listen to other people talking to you, when you, when you listen to life around you and be more aware of life, all life around you, and don't stand in the middle of the aisle 
when people are trying to get through. <laughs> and be aware that that would affect them. Be aware how your actions affect others. And then decide what to do about it. But the more we're concerned about others, the less we're caught up in our own little ego limitations. Live this inner listening. And with this inner listening, and when we bring this into every life experience and we deepen it in our sadhana, in our spiritual life, we will find that most importantly, we can hear the voice of well-being, of happiness inside ourselves. We'll stop living in emotional response and we'll begin to live on the river. Remember the definition of, uh, of God from a yogic point of view is Satchitananda ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. Ride the bliss. Listen to the bliss underneath all life experiences. And in that bliss, you will find the fulfillment that you seek, the sense of well-being and uh, the intuitive understanding that you need. And every positive experience in life, underneath it, is somehow connected to that bliss. And even the challenging things if you can go deep enough, you'll find that bliss in it. So listen deeply, listen wholeheartedly, and listen with the blessings of the Guru. Ask God and Guru to guide your understanding, and through that harmonious connection, through that um, partnership, that inner partnership, you will break down the sense of separateness, that sense that you are separate from God, separate. From the Guru. We're not. Namaskar.